And welcome to a Wednesday night Bible study here at Faith and Victory Church online. Hallelujah. Um, just um, want to welcome you to our Bible study tonight. We are continuing. Um, and, and for those, if you wonder where we were the past couple of weeks, we took a break for the um, Christmas and New Year's. And so we're back at it now, uh, full blown. And um, we've missed being with you, but um, when everybody just takes some time and spend with your family and, and get refreshed um, in, in those banners and um, praise the Lord. So, anyway, I was waiting to see for the feed to pop up so I could share it before we got started. Uh, go ahead, when, if it pops up in your, on your uh, Facebook, go ahead and share the feed. Hallelujah. So that uh, others can join us tonight. And um, currently we are meeting... Uh, virtual on Sunday mornings, um, probably for about another three weeks. And um, I, I did notice that our Facebook feed engagement went up uh, significantly by being at 1030. We're meeting at 1030. And uh, praise the Lord. All righty. Let me share it down. I just it uh, virtual on finally Sunday showed up. Hallelujah. All right. Post. I'm going to hit post. Share. And post it. All righty. And we are ready to go. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Let's get, get in here. Um, the next couple of lessons, and um, I'm debating um, whether I'm going to try to cover uh, part of the second one tonight. Uh, these are kind of um, New Old Testament um, wrap up lessons. We're going to talk about the Great Day of Atonement, and um, and then we'll get into the synopsis, um, kind of a summary of the Old Testament, uh, moving into the the eighteenth lesson, which will be the Incarnation. Um, let's go ahead and start in on the uh, Great Day of Atonement, coming out of the sixteenth chapter of the Book of Leviticus, where the um, the instructions for um, ministry and and um, so forth on the Great Day of Atonement are there, and so you um, would do you well, as uh, Kenyon says here, to read the Great uh, Chapter Sixteen and the entrance of the into the Holy of Holies um, being the one of the most significant acts of the Day of Atonement. Now, on that day, a bullock was killed. For, for the sin offering, the high priest took the basin of blood as far as the uh, labor, and then he had to go bathe, put on the white linen garments, and then come back and move the labor and carry it into the holy place. Then he took the censer uh, with live coals and put it upon uh, and put it upon uh, put in a handful into that labor. I mean that um, incense of um, sweet incense and filled um, with smoke the holy place and um, filled that up with that sweet smell. And then he would go through the curtain um, with the blood and in the cloud of that incense to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Now the word atonement means to cover, which is why it's really a, new, it's really a, a bad translation in the New Testament. When we have the atonement, because in the New Testament, we are not atoned for, we are redeemed. We're not covered by the blood of Christ. We're washed in the blood of Christ. Um, very, very meaning of the word atonement simply means to cover. So it didn't remove the sin, it covered the sin. It hid the sin from God's eyes. Hallelujah. So as the high priest came in to the holiest of all, under the covering of the smoke uh, from the incense, so he could make the atonement, the covering of the sins. Um, this after this sacrifice was only made once a year to cover spiritually dead Israel. Under the old covenant, men were not born again. Okay? They were covered. Their sins were pushed off for another year. This is why the... Um, this had to be done every year. 
pushed it off another year and pushed it off another year and pushed it off another year, pushed it off another year. But under the new covenant, Jesus has redeemed us for our sins. Uh, he appeared once and for all to obtain an eternal redemption for us. So um, remember the Bible, this is the Bible and the light of our redemption. Hallelujah. Can you say amen out there? And uh, that also wasn't so that we know you're here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, once he covered, he, he did that. In other words, the bullet was killed. His blood was taken and placed on the altar, on the Holy of Holies. Um, the priest would go out to where the scapegoat was being held. He would lay his hands on that scapegoat. And that was released into the wilderness um, to be, you know, to, to uh, hear King and says, well, wild beasts to destroy it. But it went out to the wilderness where it was, was, was destroyed. The sins were destroyed. Uh, hallelujah. God made a differentiation um, between the spiritually dead Israel and the sins they committed because they were spiritually dead. Okay? That's why there was two, there was two different sacrificial type um, events. <clears throat> the holiest of holies was the covering of spiritually dead Israel. The scapegoat was the judgment on their sins. Okay? And so their sins were, the judgment of the sins was put off onto the goat. Um, the sins were born away on the head of the scapegoat, just like Jesus put away our sin nature and made provision for the remission of our sins when we were born again. And Jesus bore both of these events. The high priest going into the holy place, making a yearly atonement, is a figure of Christ going into the heavenly holy of holies and making eternal redemption. Jesus made one sacrifice for sins forever, but the high priest made an atonement once a year. And we find uh, the New Testament reference to that in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. And so this event is really the culmination of the priesthood. It is, um, which is why Jesus was taken to the high priest um, before he was crucified. And um, that was the last official act of the priesthood was to have Jesus sent to the cross. Now, they didn't know that, but that was the, that was the summation. And so in the priesthood, the, year, the, the day of atonement is the culmination of all the law, everything under the old covenant, pointing us to Christ. Glory to God. Um, again, the typology and symbolism of these events, uh, in, in the, um, in the law given by Mo, uh, God to Moses, uh, for the priesthood, we're all pointing us to Christ to make it so plain that when Jesus showed up, you couldn't miss it and they still missed it. It's blew it completely, missed it. Hallelujah. Now, Kenyon states here that in, in his book, the you know, this basic Bible course, uh, the Bible and the Lab, our redemption, we're, the, the aspect we are majoring on is redemption. You know, we cannot cover redemption without first covering creation, the fall of man, uh, atonement for man, and the promise of the coming restoration through redemption of man. Okay? Can't really, can't really, properly understand redemption without understanding how we got to that point. Um, remember, the, the, the redemption demands incarnation. God was working all along in preparation to make redemption possible by the incarnation of a son. Man had to be redeemed from Satan's bondage to become God's child. Um, the reason for choosing a covenant people was that through them, 
he might preserve a righteous line which was man's through which man's redeemer would come. But now, so far in these lessons, we're in lesson 17 here, 16 here. Um, we studied the cutting of the covenant with Abraham, uh, by which means Abraham's descendants became God's covenant people. We've seen the deliverance out of Egypt by the hand of the covenant God. We've learned to appreciate the rights of that covenant. What it meant for God to say, by myself have I sworn. All of God's resources was, were theirs if they kept the covenants. We studied the tabernacle where God dwelt, the priesthood who acted as mediators, the offerings, which were a type of Christ and his redemptive work, God's redemption for their fellowship with him. And um, as we continue to study the history of God's covenant people, we're only going to touch, he says, we're only going to touch on it briefly until we come to the incarnation of Christ. So, and what Kenyon does now uh, in the book is he, um, instead of going into depth about every um, event throughout the Old Covenant, he places a, basically a table of events, dividing it into six different periods. And in those periods, given the major events and the major um, Bible characters who relate in those events, uh, right on up until uh, Jesus is born. <coughs> um, and so we have we have this you know chart dates and events. We're we're not going to endeavor to do that. That 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 is something that would be for your interest to read. Um, it would take you oh, to study. You know, I'd probably take you some time to study all of this out, but it's there. And it's done in a very systematic order here for you to look at. And um, so uh, it, it would be good to see it and see the, the highlights and the major characters. But uh, our, uh, we, this would be a, add another three months to our study here. And, and I think it it's, would be informational but not necessary to the story of what we're, we're studying. Okay? So let's, um, let's go ahead and jump on um, the questions that are here and what was the accomplished for Israel on the day of atonement. And that is Israel had its sins covered for another year and the blood of the sacrificial lamb was sprinkled on the mercy seat and the sins are off or confessed upon the scapegoat, liberating Israel for one more year. Hallelujah. Now during the old Testament period toward what event is God working, and why? Well, as we've already just stated, God is working toward the time when redemption shall be made possible through the incarnation of his son. And why? Because man had to be redeemed from Satan's bondage in order to become God's child. Hallelujah. What can you uh, tell what you can of the covenant? the reason for its existence and its significance. And the covenant was cut with Abraham in order to have his descendants as God's covenant people. It is through them that he would preserve a righteous line that the Redeemer would come through. Hallelujah. And how does the tabernacle priesthood and offerings show the hunger for God, the hunger of God, for fellowship with man. Because the tabernacle is where God dwelt, the priesthood who acted as his mediators and the offering, a type of Christ and his redemptive work, God's provision for their fellowship with him. And so, again, chapter 16 um, is very informational uh, beyond covering the, a little bit about the Day of Atonement. Um, but again, the Day of Atonement was type, uh, had typology, allegorical, pointing to one event. And that was Jesus Christ uh, taking our sin, being judged for our sin, being raised from the dead um, in the incarnation and re our restoration through faith in him. So let's step over. 
into the synopsis of the Old Testament books. Now, this is not all the books. Um, there's a limited another number here of major events. Remember the the prophets and the Psalms, the poet, the books of poetry, the books of prophecy. Um, you know, there, there's this is kind of a sampling here that show major events, particularly surrounding major. Um, Bible characters. Now, Numbers derives its name from the fact that it records the enumeration of Israel. Historically, Numbers takes up the story where Exodus left off and is the book of the wilderness wanderings of the covenant people. Consequently, uh, consequent upon their failure to enter the land of Kadesh Barnea. There are some who take the books of the Old Testament typical, uh, typically such as Genesis being called the book of creation and the fall, Exodus of redemption, Leviticus of worship and fellowship, numbers of that which should follow service and walk. Now, Kenyon says he doesn't, he doesn't uh, give the books in this form. Israel is spiritually dead and tested by its wilderness experience. They utterly failed. So he, did like, he doesn't like to use it as a type of the victorious walk in life of man who's become a new creature in Christ, who has passed absolutely from the realm and authority of Satan into the realm and life of Jesus Christ. Okay? And this is this is an opinion of his. He he, he takes a different view of it, thinking that the uh, the failures of Israel disqualify some of these things as being typology of of these different aspects of the believer. And um, so he, he doesn't like to do that. But that, that is a lot of theological um, prospectus that you will see. Okay. Um, now he says numbers can be divided into five sections. The order of the host from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, Israel at Kadesh Barnea, the wilderness wanderings, and then closing instructions. Now the events recorded in numbers occur over a period of 39 years. Hallelujah. Then he goes on and says Deuteronomy can be divided into seven sections. The summary of the history of Israel in the wilderness, a reinstatement of the law with warnings and exhortations, then instructions, warnings, and predictions, the great, the great closing prophecy announcing the history of Israel to the second coming of Christ, Christ and a promise of their possession of Palestine. Number five, it lasts, um, it, the last councils to priests, Levites, and Joshua. The Song of Moses and his parting blessing. And then last, the death of Moses, who had 120 when he died, his eye was not dim, neither was his natural force abated. This was because Moses was a covenant man. And then the book of Joshua, who succeeded Moses as the, uh, the ruler of Israel under God, uh, the government was still theocratic. God was still ultimately in charge. Um, the events of Joshua cover a period of 26 years. Um, first divided into the conquest, the division of the inheritance, the incipient discord, and Joshua's last councils and death. So this 26-year period, they go in and possess the land. Caleb gets his mountain. They, um, you know, go in for five years and, and, and uh, take cities and um, conquer and you know, so forth and so on. And then after five years of doing all that, Caleb goes and gets his mountain. Hallelujah. Uh, then uh, Kenya cover uh, the synopsis of Judges, which is the book takes its name from the 13 men raised up to deliver Israel in the de um, declision, <laughs> declination, declin oh boy, the declining and disunion they follow the death of Joshua. I'm not even. Declan, Declanson. 
Declanation. D E C L E N S I O N. Declension. 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 Woo! Declension. That took some work. Hallelujah. If you were an English major, that wouldn't happen. Well, I'm not. <laughs> From the declension and disunion, and you stop laughing. I want to know how many out there are watching or laughing. Put your laughing face up if you're laughing. All right, I'm waiting to see it. Anybody laughing out there? Ah, now your name didn't come by, so I don't know who it was. A bunch of them. Oh, Ellie confessed. Okay. I'm just messing with y'all. Yeah, that one was tough. I just looked at it wrong and I... Oh, good gracious. Apparently that was hilarious. But I got it now. The declension. <laughs> Thank you. Penny, Penny's being sweet. She, she held up a white flag. Um, the key verse explaining the condition of Israel in Judges 17.6 is every man did that which was right in his own sight. And boy, are we living there today. Maybe you need Jesus. We need to do what's right in the sight of God. Amen. Um, two prominent facts in Judges um, is that the utter failure of the spiritually dead covenant people and the grace of the covenant God. Hallelujah. And the Judges reveals seven apostasies, seven servitudes, to 700 nation, seven heathen nations and seven deliverances. And the events and judges cover 305 years. My, my, my. Somebody's still laughing. Ruth, which should be read in conjunction with the first half of Judges, uh, because it pre presents a picture of the life of Israel at that time. And the book of Ruth covers about 10 years. And then 1 Samuel gives us the personal history of Samuel, Samuel, the last of the judges. And it records the moral failure of the priesthood under Eli and of the judges in Samuel's attempt to make the office hereditary. In his prophetic uh, uh, office, Samuel was faithful. And, and in him begins the line of writing prophets. From now on, the prophet, not the priest, is conspicuous in Israel. There's another one of them words. I'm so glad I speak in tongues. Conspicuous. <laughs> is it that bad? <laughs> Conspicuous. Is that not what it is? Huh? Conspicuous. 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 I'm gonna put. I'm gonna put that in my phone and have it tell me how to pronounce it. All right. Which is what I should have done before I did this lesson. <laughs> All right. Well, y'all stop it out there laughing. Y'all are just having too, good, too much fun on the internet. During this period, Israel repudiated God as king and desired a king like the other nations around them. And God gives them a king, Saul. I can pronounce that, Saul. All right. Four, uh, divided into four parts. Hmm. The story of Samuel to the death of Eli. The taking of the ark to the demand for a king, the reign of Saul to the call of David, and the call of David to the death of Saul. These events cover 150 years. <coughs> Second Samuel marks the restoration of order 
through the enthroning of God's King David. It also gives to us the establishment of Israel's political center in Jerusalem. And it covers from the death of Saul to the anointing of David over Judah in Hebron, from the anointing in Hebron to the establishment of David over the united Israel, from the conquest of Jerusalem to the rebellion of Absalom, and from the rebellion of Absalom to the purchase of the temple site. Um, and these cover 38 years. The book of 2 Samuel covers 38 years. The first kings records the death of David, the reign of Solomon, the building of the temple, the death of Solomon, the division of king under Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and the history of the two kingdoms to the reign of Jer uh, Jehoroam over Judah and Isaiah over Samaria. It includes mighty ministry, the mighty ministry of Elijah. And in chapter 17, it shows the fearless action of this covenant man upon the word of God. The events recorded, recorded in 1 Kings cover 118 years. 2 Kings, divided into seven parts, the last ministry and translation of Elijah, the ministry of Elisha, from the translation of Elijah to the uh, anointing of Jehu, the reign of Jehu over Israel, the reigns of Atahila and jo, uh, Jeho Jehoash over Judah, the reigns of Jehoash and Joash over Israel, and the last ministry of Elisha. From the death of Elisha to the captivity of Israel. <coughs> now Israel was carried into captivity into Syria because they had broken the covenant. From this captivity, the ten tribes have never been restored to Palestine. And from the, since, uh, the ascension of Hezekiah to the captivity of Judah. Uh, this period covers uh, 308 years. And during this period, Amos and Hosea prophesied in Israel, Obadiah, Joel, Isaiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah prophesied in Judah. Hallelujah. Um, first and second chronicles together cover the period of the death of Saul to the captivities. They were probably written during the Babylonian captivity and are distinguished from the two books of Kings in a fuller account of Ju Judah and the omission of many details. Um, many, there, there was a time when First, Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles were, were referred to as First, Second, Third, and Fourth Kings. Okay, but they um, they changed that and, and referred to these two since they deal more with Judah. Uh, in the captivity in, Bab um, in Babylonian captivity of 75 years. And so they they gave that name of Chronicles. But there, there, there are some uh, times in history that those four books were referred to as the f first and fourth books of Kings. Just thought I'd give you that information. Hallelujah. Ezra records uh, the return of Palestine under Zerubbabel by the decree of Cyrus who laid the temple uh, foundations in 536 B.C. And later at 458 B.C., Ezra followed and restored the law and ritual. But the masses of the nation and most of the princes remained uh, by preference in Babylon and Assyria where they were prospering. The post-captivity books deal with that remnant which alone remembered the covenant God. And it's divided into two parts. From the decree of Silas to the dedication of the restored temple and the ministry of Ezra. It covers a period of 80 years. Nehemiah records uh, the return to Palestine under Zerubbabel by the decree of Silas, who laid the temple foundations in 536. Um, wow. I didn't really notice this. It records basically the same thing as Ezra. So we're not going to read all that again. Hallelujah. It covers 10 years. All right. So it, it's a concurrent book of Ezra, but for 10 years of it. 
Esther, being one of the most beautiful of Old Testament literature, through the name of God does not occur once in it. It is a book that shows the hand of God as almost no other book. Esther becomes the favorite wife of Ahasuerus. Yeah, Ahasuerus. Yeah, not be mistaken with the mouth of Saurus. Hallelujah, which my daughter, if she's watching. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do what? <laughs> I'm sure I'll find out she's watching in a minute. Hallelujah. I'm on a roll tonight. I'm having one of them Jesse Duplantis services. By her absolute obedience to her uncle, she becomes the savior of the chosen people. No more beautiful character or heroine can be found in the Chronicles of the Old Testament. And it covers about 11 years. Job, oh boy. Now we studied uh, the historical books of the Old Testament. And uh, this is one of the poetical books. Um, and they're God's song books. Here we find the heart uh, cries of God's people of their fears and faith and their belongings. Job is the first book written. In other words, chronologically, it's the oldest book in the Bible. Okay. It was written before Genesis. Um, tradition puts the date about 1700 BC. Now, Job was a direct relative of Abraham. Uh, he he um, gathered the universal desires of the human race and put them into this great poem of agony. One of the problems he faced was how man who is born of a woman can stand right with God. He gives to us the suggestion of the fall, showing the extent of man's uh, the extent of man's treason. The heavens are not clean in God's sight. Job fifteen fifteen. He recognized man's need of a mediator and cried, "There is no umpire betwixt us that he may lay his hand upon us both." He cried for a restoration of righteousness. And in these longings of Job, we see the longings of each race has had and ex uh, expressed in its human religion. Job stood the test of Satan. He never lost God's favor. We see in this book the whole plan of redemption portrayed. He began in the Garden of Eden and went through the agonies of long struggle, a suffering man. He gave to us the suggestion of redemption that ends in Eden restored. The Psalms, Israel's songbook, their expressions, longings, heartaches, tears, and desires of the people of the first covenant. They represent the daily experiences in some aspects, and in others, they are prophecies of something that is utterly beyond them, only found in the new creation. The books are generally divided into five sections. And that's, you know, you can read that, chapters 1 through 40. Yeah, we're not going to read all those divisions. The uh, imprecatory psalms are a cry for vengeance upon enemies. They have um, bothered lots of devour, um, devout people. But when you realize that Israel was not Christian, that they had never been born again, they were just Jews uh, under the blood of bulls and goats, you can understand how those psalms could be written in what they want in vengeance instead of forgiveness and mercy. The miracle is that the Psalms, like Psalm 23, 27, 39, and 71, could be written by natural man. It proves the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Then we go to the book of Proverbs. Um, it's the wisdom book of the Old Covenant. It is the interpretation of the law in daily life. It is what the book of James is to the New Covenant. James is writing for the New Covenant folks and is giving wisdom for their daily walk. Proverbs should be read with great care. Every boy and girl, every youth in our grammar school should read and study the book of Proverbs. The man who absorbs the wisdom of Proverbs will seldom fall into the snares of modern life. <laughs> Amen. Ecclesiastes is the most unique book in the Old Testament. Uh, it's a picture of a spiritually dead man trying to find pleasure 
in the world. He tried to find it in building and archaeological um, ambitions, built uh, great buildings. He tried to find it in horticulture. He had the most beautiful gardens perhaps the world has ever seen up to the time. He tried it in vast public works. He tried it with wine. He tried it with women and song. And in the conclusion of things, he said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The last chapter, he sang the song of failure of natural man to achieve the desires of the human spirit. And Song of Solomon has idols and sonnets and sonnets of Christ and the church. It is filled with beautiful imagery. It is a love dream put into poetic expression. It gives pictures of broken fellowship and the loneliness of the heart that has lost its love. It gives triumphs of fellowship when the heart walks in the fulfillment of its privileges. And so I thought we might actually get to, or I didn't know that we get through both of these tonight, but that's, that's fine. Again, very informational. And um, we wanted to cover them, but at the same time, we wanted to get you know through so we got to start moving into um, the more deeper things that we're after, heading towards the New Testament, the Incarnation. Let's go over these uh, questions real quick. What portions of Israel's history does uh, New Numbers and Numbers? I started to say New Deuteronomy and Numbers. Go ahead, guys. Put the laughing faces out there. What part of history do Numbers and Deuteronomy cover? Numbers takes off where Exodus left off. And the book is the book of the wilderness wanderings of the covenant people consequent upon their failure to enter the land of Kadesh Barnea. And the Deuteronomy summarizes Israel history in the wilderness and then covers Israel until the death of Moses. What are the two prominent facts uh, revealed in Judges? One, the utter failure of the spiritually dead covenant people. And two, the grace of the covenant God. And who was the last of the judges and who was the first king? Samuel was the last of the judges and Saul was the first king. Why was Israel carried into captivity into Assyria? Because Israel had broken the covenant. What was the work of Nehemiah? He came to Jerusalem and rebuilt the wall, restored true worship, gave the law to the common people, and separated Israel from the nations around them. Number seven, what problems of the human race are recognized by Job? That is the fall of man, man's need of a mediator, and a longing for restoration. What messages are in the Psalms? Um, expressions of longing, heartaches, tears, desires of the people uh, of the first covenant. They represent the daily experiences in some respects and in others. They are prophecies of something that is utterly beyond them. Hallelujah. What purpose did the book of Proverbs serve? It is the interpretation of the law in daily life. And we ask what um, is given to us, what picture is given to us in Ecclesiastes or in, and in the Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes is the picture of the spiritual dead man trying to find pleasure in the world. And Song of Solomon are the Idols, I-D-Y-L-L, -L. idols, I-D-Y-L-L, -L. it's a poetic term, idols, idols, okay, anyway, in sonnets of Christ, idol is a simple descriptive work in poetry or prose that deals with the rustic life or pastoral scenes or suggests a mood of peace and contentment. A narrative poem uh, treated as an epic, romantic, or tragic thing. Um, so that that's what that is. <coughs> and sonnets are um, a fixed verse form of Italian origin, consisting of fourteen lines that are typically five 
uh, foot iambics, rhythm rhyming according to the prescribed scheme. Also, it's a poem in that pattern. Okay? So, I want to give a definition for them instead of just having this going around. Well, I heard it, but I don't know what it means. Praise the Lord. Um, it, we can't, this was kind of to wrap up the Old Testament part of, um, by and large, um, of this, this study. We will move into the incarnation next, um, beginning next week, which obviously moves us into um, the, the Gospels and the New Testament. So I'm looking forward to that because that's what we're, we've laid the foundation. We've laid, laid how man got where he was, established what man needed, and now we're going to bring him into that and then that walk, okay, over the last, oh, I think 20, 20, 21 lessons, somewhere around there. Hallelujah. Um, I want to remind you, we are currently meeting virtual um, probably for the first three to four weeks of January. I believe there are five Sundays in this month. Um, we're hoping to be able to move into our place sooner than that. But um, as it be, we... <coughs> we're going to be virtual until we move uh, into our place. So, hallelujah. We are meeting at 1030 on Sunday mornings, um, which is a much you know, more conducive time. And um, we're look, we are glad to be doing that and uh, glad to be moving forward. Um, don't, don't forget, because we're meeting virtually, um, offerings, your tithe offerings uh, can be given either on PayPal or square cash or mail to us. If you need a mailing address, you just let us know and we'll get that to you. Um, and uh, praise the Lord. And I hope you all had fun tonight. I had fun tonight. The crowd here had fun tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got to be, you know, uh, the uh, the laughing stock. Praise the Lord. I was a computer guy. I wasn't an English guy. Hallelujah. And I have been called a neologian before. The inventor of new words. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All righty. But till we meet again, till we see you again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And I am looking forward now to moving into the incarnation. This gives, Now we start getting to the exciting stuff. Okay? And, you know, the typology stuff is, is good. It shows us where we're coming from. But now we start getting into the exciting stuff where it applies to us today. And, and then I'll walk with God down. And that's really exciting. Praise the Lord. Um, remember 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatsoever born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. See you Sunday at 1030 here, Faith and Victory Church, online.